Um, so the poetic title of this talk is Seeing Worlds in a Grain of Sand. Um, and um, I like to use this title because I think this is what we are trying to do with the study of the Britisks. We are trying to learn about planetary systems um, in an indirect way. Um, so as you know, stars form in molecular clouds that are composed of gas and dust in a 100 to 1 uh, mass ratio. A fragment of the cloud collapses under, um, uh, maybe due to shock, and then it starts um, uh, collapsing, and this uh, forms a, a, an envelope. Uh, from uh, and out of this envelope, you uh, uh, have a, a nascent star. Um, part of the envelope collapses, and due to conservation of angular momentum, you form a protoplanetary disk. Uh, and part of the mass in this disk uh, accretes into the star, and other part of the uh, and, and other part of the disk, the mass in the disk is ejected into outflows. But the stuff that uh, that remains in the in the disk, the dust particles start accreting uh, in the core accretion model. At least uh, they start accreting uh, and forming larger and larger aggregates. Uh, this is an example of one of those aggregates um, uh, of a dust particle collected in the solar system. And as I said, in the core, uh, in the core accretion model, uh, this, uh, because some of the collisions are, are, um, uh, are not destructive, uh, you start forming larger and larger particles, and um, you start forming planetesimals, and out of the planetesimals, you form uh, larger and larger cores, and out of the larger cores, you form the planets, and um, if you know, the, the cores are large enough, they have enough, um, uh, they have enough mass to attract gas from the disk, and you form the giant planets, so like in this artist's uh, representation. And then you end up with systems that look like this. This is not an artist's representation. This is actually an observation of a one mi million year old uh, protostar um, observed by ALMA very recently. And what you find here, you have a disk of gas and dust, and you have a, a lot of a structure that is created probably by massive bodies that have already formed in the disk by, by planets, and they start clearing out part of uh, these rings. Um, and um, in this image, we think that some of these rings might be in resonance, indicating that the planets that are forming are in resonance, and also you can see some azimuth, uh, some uh, axitim, uh, some asymmetric structure, but we don't know, that also m might give you a hint of where these massive bodies might be located, but we still don't know like to what degree we can uh, trust this structure because interferometry observations have a really funny noise if, you know, and, and uh, the noise, yeah? N no, not yet. So this is, so the only, that, the only thing that I can say about this image is that there is evidence that planets are forming here, that there is evidence that there are several. <laughs> we don't know if this is, you can, we can they trust the yeah, they the Yeah, they, they believe the holes. They don't believe, they, I don't think we can still believe the asymmetries. So, but the interesting part about this image, um, and I wanted to show it because it's in the context of what I'm going to be talking about now, is that this is a very young system. It's only one million year old. And you know, up to now we've been very worried that planets didn't have enough time to form because they are planets need to have the gas. And they, we know from, the studies of, of uh, protoplanetary disks and debris disks that the gas disappears within 10 to uh, six to 10 million years. But this system is only one million year old. So the planets have accreted very fast. Apparently they have no problem. And also another interesting thing about this um, uh, system is that there is evidence of magnetic fields. And this comes from different observations from uh, polarimetry observations. And it's interesting because you generally find them in younger systems, but not this late. So this is an interesting system in which you have magnetic fields very late, and you also have planets very early. So they are overlapping planet formation and, and the presence of magnetic fields so is present. And it has yet, so yeah, exactly, it has, you know, a bow shot. So they, they, it has a heavy hero object. So it's not surprising that there are magnetic fields, but I don't think they expected to have this structure. And of course, this is only possible with ALMA because in the visible, where you can have similar spatial resolution, you know, with HSC, you are only seeing the outside. This is all embedded. So here you're seeing the mid plane, but in the visible, you are only seeing like the scattered light, and you don't see any of this structure. So so how do you know it's a 
the, uh, the, well, it's a, that's a good question. I don't know what, the, like exactly what uh, estimates they have, but it's like, a, I think it's a, a between class, class one and class two object. So it's very young and it's still embedded in an envelope, in a thick envelope. But I don't know exactly what method they use, they me what method they use for the eight days are very uncertain, right? So, but it's certainly a young object. So I wanted to show you this image uh, to, to put it, the, the, this talk in context. So, um, so this is one million years old. Um, so the, and you know that planets may be forming in these areas or may have formed in this area. So, and what we are seeing here is, uh, this is primordial gas and primordial dust. This is coming from the molecular cloud out of which the star was formed. Um, but after the gas is gone, as I said, in about six to 10 million years, uh, the system should look something like this. You will have, for this particular star, right? You will have a star in the middle. In this case, it's about half a solar mass. And uh, you will have some planets, and, you know. Um, and after the gas is gone, the primordial dust leaves the system fairly quickly um, uh, due to the effect of pointing Robertson drags, uh, interaction of the dust particles with the stellar photons, they lose orbital energy, the particles start spiraling inward toward the central star until they sublimate, right? And, uh, or, the, or, you know, the dust can also disappear due to grain-grain collisions. The particles collide with each other until they break in uh, species that are small enough to be blown by, by radiation pressure. And the time scales of this, I'm showing you the equations here, the time scales are very fast. So um, in about um, um, approximately, in, in less than one million years after the, the gas is gone, you will expect, expect to have absolutely no dust in the system, primordial dust. Um, but um, the fact is that we observe dust around stars that are much, much older than those 10 million years, right? Um, for example, in our own solar system, this is an image of the zodiacal light in our solar system, and this is produced by light scatter of the stars, and our solar system is fairly much, I mean, it's way, way older than these 10 million years, right? So, um, and where is this dust coming from? This dust is coming from, in uh, the case of the solar system, it's coming from objects like comets here. You can see the, the, the um, comet um, Halley. Uh, no, sorry, not Halley, this is Halley Bob. <laughs> so Halley was a long time ago, this is Halley Bob. And um, so in the solar system, dust is produced by comets. Uh, this is a spectacular, very recent image, only a few uh, days ago uh, from um, Rosetta's comet. You can see the streams you know, of gas and dust. This is, uh, and, and this comet is still not uh, so close to the sun, so this is just starting. So we are seeing dust being produced in the solar system, right? And uh, this is another spectacular image by HST. Uh, it's not a comet, it's an asteroid, uh, and it's producing a lot of dust, probably due to, the, um, to hyper -velo uh, velocity uh, impact or maybe due to rotational uh, disruption. And here, like in this case, the, the ratio of the total debris that is produced to the, to, the ma to the mass of the nucleus is about 0.1. So uh, actually there is a lot of dust that is being produced here. And these types, uh, according to, you, uh, to David Hewitt, this type of objects could account for about 3% of the zodiacal light that we observe the, the, the asteroids, from the asteroids, so comet-like asteroids, 3%. Um, and uh, so we have dust being produced in the asteroid, This, um, I don't think it is understood. Um, so as I said, they, what they are trying to, so it, so it has, they are trying to see if it's coming from rotational disruption. I mean, from a high, yeah, high, uh, high velocity impact or rotational disruption. So I don't think it's completely understood, no. But um, I, I haven't been keeping up with the literature on here, so. So there is dust being produced in the inner system. Uh, this is our asteroid belt uh, from, you know, these uh, comet-like asteroids, but also from uh, asteroids colliding. There is also dust being produced in the outer system. You cannot see it here, but this is the Kuiper belt. And, um, and right now in the solar system, there is not, not that much dust that is being produced. Um, but um, before when uh, the planetesimal belts were more densely populated, the dust production rate was much higher. And then there was an event of planetesimal clearing. Uh, here I'm showing um, the predictions from the, well, not predictions, the, 
they are not really predicting anything because it's you know backward modeling. But it's like the, from the NIST model, whether or not you believe the NIST model, the the clear thing is that there has been planetesimal the clearing in the solar system, and that before the the planet the the, the both the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt were much more densely populated, and there is evidence of that. For example, from from um, uh, you know, if you look at the um, binarity of Kuiper belts, in order to explain the binarity of Kuiper belt objects, you need to have a much more densely populated uh, uh, belt in the past. And there are different evidence that, you know, the, the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt were more densely populated. And then the dust production rate was much higher. And um, so today the solar system um, is uh, significantly fainter, fainter than what we observe around other stars. It's the, the debris dust, we call this debris dust, because it's dust that is not primordial, it's coming from the collisions of, of planetesimals. So uh, we do observe this type of objects around other stars, but only for systems that are significantly more massive than the sun, just because the observations are sensitivity limited. So with, um, with uh, Herschel, um, um, this is the, the disk uh, incident rate that we observe. And um, we can go up to like an order of magnitude. Uh, um, we can get to an order of magnitude, the level of, ma of, of dust in the solar system. So, so we observe dust that is, it depends the how uh, far is the star, right? But we, can, we cannot see the level of dust in our solar system, but 10 times more. Um, and uh, the frequency of, the, of debris disks is, um, uh, you know, about 25%, uh, 20% for A, F, Js, and Ks, and then much lower for M stars. But here we are uh, strongly sensitivity limited because this disk will be l uh, cold, and with Herschel we can get to, to 500 microns, but not with enough sensitivity. So, so it's very likely. Right. So. I'm going to go into that now. But uh, there is a range of ages here, but generally they are older than 100 million years. So, but I will talk a bit about the evolution of the debris disks in a, in a little bit. The, uh, what I wanted to point out in this slide is that there is evidence of dust uh, around, um, of debris disks, of planetesimals, planetesimal formation really, around a star with a wide range of spectral types. Um, which is a wide range of stellar luminosities, indicating that planetesimal formation is probably a very robust process that can take place under a wide range of conditions. Uh, you know, there are uh, orders of magnitude difference in stellar luminosities here. And also we have evidence, as Roman knows very well, there is evidence of dust around uh, uh, the white dwarf as, as well, indicating that planetesimal formation has taken place around uh, uh, the progenitors of the stars that are more massive, right? So. This is just to tell you that, um, you know, debris are very common. We are likely only seeing the tip of the iceberg due to the sensitivity, the limits in the sensitivity, and that um, they are very common, and this indicates that planetesimal formation is quite, quite robust. As to the sensitivity, we don't know yet. You, we don't know yet because I think here we have very low s number of statistics for the end. It's also possible that the uh, range of uh, uh, Yeah, uh, yeah, as well, yeah. So, th so, uh, and this goes back to the question about evolution, right? Like, point, yeah. So, um, so one thing that was not a surprise is when with a Spitzer we uh, could observe so we know that planets and debris disks coexist, right? And these were, at the time of the Sp uh, Spitzer was flying, these were the multiple planet systems that were known to have debris disks. And in here, what, so the black area, the black regions is where the, the, the dust is expected to, to be present based on analysis of the spectral energy distributions and based on dynamical simulations to see what niches uh, have enough st uh, stability, they were the, in what areas can the planetesimals be stable for long regions. And w now with, the, um, with Herschel, we can observe many more systems. And um, there is evidence, so we have observed 37 systems, and there is evidence of um, planetary systems, I mean, and there is evidence of dust around 10 of these systems. So there is a few more uh, uh, dust disks that have been detected around planet-bearing stars. 
No, uh, but Herschel, I mean, Herschel is more sensitive than the Spitzer, but not that much, because Herschel is not cooled down. But <coughs> the advantage of Herschel is that it has a much better spatial resolution, and, and that allows you to uh, get rid of confused objects. So, so in fact, well, that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about. That's the talk, what the talk is about. Another indirect evidence, so I'm not going to answer because that would be a spoiler, right? <laughs> Another indirect evidence that planets and debris, that, that you know, you may have planets uh, in, in the British systems is the structure. This is just a model of how the structure in the Kuiper Belt would look like, and I want to show this because, um, um, so the structure maybe so the, uh, the the dust in this model is produced in the Kuiper Belt, so outside the orbit of Neptune, and then it drifts inward due to pointing Robertson drag, and as it drifts, it, the particles can get trapped in mimos and resonances with the planets, and this creates the rings, and this creates this asymmetric structure. And then uh, there is also um, uh, when the particles get close to the orbit of Saturn and Jupiter, they can get ejected just due to gravitational scattering, right? So you and and this uh, produces this inner evacuated region. So um, this is, of course, a model, so this doesn't give you evidence or, of anything, but it makes you understand some of these other observations uh, so, um, in which you can see a structure that is reminiscent of what I just explained. So this is um, um, an observation of Esfiloret, uh, Esfiloneridani, uh, which shows, again, some ring-like structure, some um, asymmetries. Um, this is another debris showing uh, these brightness asymmetries that may be produced by secular perturbations. Um, this is a uh, two edge on this, uh, a unique and beta peak, showing these wraps that may be also due to secular perturbations produced by a planet that is at a different, uh, at a different uh, angle than the disk. And of course, this is foam hot, um, showing a very sharp inner edge that may be produced by, by a massive object that was later found found, although, you know, it's very, there's a lot of controversy whether this is a planet or not, but there is something in there that is orbiting the star, and um, at the beginning it was thought that may be able to carve this sharp inner edge, now it's not clear, but, but you know, there are s indications from the debris that something might be present there, because otherwise it's difficult to explain uh, some of this uh, structure. Yes, yeah, so this one is a scatter light, and this other, like this other is thermal emission, and this is thermal emission. So there is a, a diversity here of observations. Is this the scattering of the scattering of the no, 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 not at all, not at all, not at all, no, no. Um, so, um, so going back to Scott's question, are debris and planets correlated? So why are we interested in this? Because this can shed light on the formation and evolution of planetary systems. And it may help predict the presence of, of planets around stars with certain these characteristics. So, so when the Spitzer observations came out, there was, you know, uh, some, uh, uh, like the GTO team did a very quick analysis of their data, and they uh, got a tentative result that debris are actually more prevalent, uh, prevalent in system, uh, more dusty in systems with high mass planets. And everybody was like, ah, oh, of course. I mean, you need planetesimals. I mean, if you have planets, it means that you have planetesimals, and then it's more dusty, so it's obvious. Then, um, but then I, I went back to the data and uh, analyzed that data together with uh, the, f the, the FEPS legacy survey data, and I looked at this, and I found that there was no evidence of correlation. I didn't find any evidence of correlations, and then if you think about it, um, and, and you put it in perspective in the sense that, you know, the British seems to be evident, ar evident around stars with a wide range of masses, and I say, as I said, right? So it seems that planetesimal formation is quite robust. It can take place under a wide range of conditions, and planets cannot. So if, you know, if the conditions to form planetesimals are, are more commonly met than the conditions to form planets, there is no reason why you would expect a, 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 to have a correlation then, right? And so, uh, and this was in agreement, I guess, with, with the core accretion models, what you would expect from the core accretion models, and also uh, from the evidence that you're getting from correlations with a stellar metallicity, because um, high, uh, high mass planets are highly correlated with high stellar metallicities, but debris disks are not. So, um, so it made sense that debris disks and planets are not necessarily correlated. Yes, Jeremy? Mm -hmm. 
So in this study, I only used a Spitzer observation. So it was like, you know, 24 micron, 70 micron wavelength. So um, I wasn't looking at a scatter light observation. And, and for, there are not that many systems that have been observed in a scatter light. They are more spectacular, so they are very well known. But uh, really, the statistics can be done for, uh, are being done for the. Yeah. So this was this study was done only for solar type. In terms of, of size, yes. So the uh, in terms of the dust location, so the dust location. These are Kuiper belt like objects. So these are stars. Most of these stars had emission at 70 micron, but not at 24 micron. So that indicates that they are around Kuiper belt. If you look at the distribution, I don't think I have this plot here, but if you look at the distribution of where the inner edge of the dust would be is located around 30 to 40 uh, a astronomical units. So these are things similar to the Kuiper belt. So what we are looking at is at the correlation between the coldest um, planets. Uh, there is some gas. Uh, generally, it was assumed that there was none, but then there is some observation that there is uh, some gas, but it's not primordial gas. It's probably coming. It's not clear where it's coming from, but it might be coming from outgassing from, out from the grains it, uh, themselves. For the dust that, for the dust that is get, the, for the warm dust, yeah, yeah, for the warm dust, yes, 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 yes. Um, the problem with the warm dust uh, is that the sensitivity, so the sensitivity for for the Spitzer, the sensitivity to the cold dust was about a hundred times the amount of dust in the Kuiper belt. But the sensitivity for the warm dust at 24 microns, because that emission is closer to the stellar photosphere. Um, the stellar photosphere, I mean, is brighter at 24 microns. The sensitivity there was about a thousand times the amount of dust in the in the in the asteroid belt. So you are not comparing equal and equal yet. And the problem with Herschel is that it doesn't go to short wavelengths. The shortest wavelength is 70 microns. So uh, so the but the the warm dust observations are very interesting, and I will refer to them in the uh, later in the talk. They are very interesting because uh, they can. Um, in the context of terrestrial planet finding, uh, of, of pro you know, the prospects of, of uh, being able to detect and characterize terrestrial planets, because they are a contaminant, right? Um, so, okay, so we found from Spitzer that um, high mass planets are not correlated with um, the presence of, deb of debris. And, um, but at the time we were, and at the time we were only looking at high mass planets, because those were the only ones that were known. Uh, so these were planets that were older than about 30 Earth masses or so, right? But now with Herschel, um, at the time of Herschel, there's a lot more information from the radial velocity surveys. We have all these new population of low mass planets that have appeared and are fairly common. And you know, the, the, the incident rate can be characterized now. Um, and then with Herschel, as I said, we are a bit more sensitive, uh, we can detect fainter and colder disks, and also because it has better resolution, you c it's less subject to confusion. So in some cases, the incident rate of, of debris disks, <coughs> instead of going up, it has gone down because some of the sources were like confused, 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 right? So, um, but, so this has improved our knowledge of the, of the disk frequency. So now we have a better knowledge of the planet frequency and the disk frequency. So again, people <laughs> look uh, whether or not there was a tentative um, uh, whether or not there was a correlation between low mass planets and debris disks. And they, you know, they, what they found is that there is tentative evidence from using the Herschel and the Dunes debris disk surveys that there is such a correlation. What is the, the, the temperature. Yeah. So the temperature of the disk is uh, found from, I can show you, for example, here. The temperature of the disk is found from the spectral energy division. So Herschel observations are these ones here. You know, starting at 70, 100, 250, 300. Yeah, this is thermal emission from the disk. So, yeah, 
So here is the, so this is the emission from the star. This is the stellar photosphere. And this is the, and you, you, what you see is that there is dust in excess of what you will expect from the stellar photosphere. So you can fit, you know, subtracting what you expect from the, the stellar photosphere, which is quite well constrained because you have a lot of ancillary data. You, go, you, you know, you do models to see, you know, how much, uh, where the dust would be located. And, and generally, one components are fine. Sometimes you need two components or two temperature, uh, two temperature uh, models in order to fit the observations. But this is how you can estimate where the, the dust would be located. And um, so, so there was tentative evidence that uh, debris disks are more common about uh, in, in systems with low mass planets. Using the, the surveys, the, the two key surveys done by Herschel, uh, Debris and, and uh, Dunes. And then, <laughs> uh, you probably know where I'm going now, I went to the data and um, I tried to see if I could uh, recover that evidence of a correlation. And um, again, using those, that, those same surveys, uh, but using the cleanest possible sample. And uh, so the, the two surveys are um, debris. It's looking at 446 stars, M2A type. It's volume limited. And this is the volume limits, right? And then dunes um, is looking at 133 stars, um, generally solar type. Um, and it's like complete within 20 parsecs, although they are excluding orb uh, objects that are like in, uh, in regions with high infrared background. And then they added a bunch of uh, stars with known, uh, um, known to have either debris disks or planets. But I excluded this because this will bias the sample, right? So, um, and this is how the observations look like. Like in some cases, you have clear evidence of a disk. You know, the, the excess is here and it's the observations are especially resolved, right? So this is the, the, this is the observations. This is the PSF and these are the residu uh, residuals when you subtract it. In some other keys, uh, uh, so these are like for a uh, uh, G-type uh, G star, uh, F-type star. And in some other systems where there is evidence of dust, um, like here is a, a seven sigma detection, uh, but you know, the, the it's especially unresolved. So the only way to constrain where the dust is located will be from the SCD, from this type of models. But yes, I know we have some systems like that. So that's the type of data that we are dealing with. And then, as I said, because the spatial resolution is fairly, is better than a Spitzer, then we can reject the ones that are confused, that have like galaxies near here, that would have produced an excess where it's not associated with the disk. So using these samples, I, um, I clean all these samples as much as I could. I, uh, I only selected the F, G, and K stars. I excluded the A types and the M types. The A types, because we know very little about the planet population around the A types, and because I'm looking at the correlation, our, our stars are main sequence, but the only stars that have been searched for planets are evolved A's, because that's where you have the jitter that is low enough, and the absorption lines are low enough in order to be able to search for the planets. And I excluded the M's because we have very low number of statistics there, and maybe because we might be proving a different regime in of planetesimal formation, as, as Roman was pointing out. We may have winds early on that clear the disk. So, so I, um, I, excluded, I, I excluded A type and M types. I was only looking at, at solar type. And then I only kept the stars that are within 20 parsecs, so because that's where the surveys are to maximize the survey completeness. Um, because uh, um, beyond 20 parsecs, the, the dune survey was biased because it was just picking sources known to have planets and known to have disks. And then I, because something that Scott talked about, there is evolution in the ages, uh, in the disk emission as a function of age. And a Spitzer saw that there is evolution within uh, the first 100 million years, but then there is no significant evolution seen after 100 million years. So um, I excluded all the stars that did not have age estimates. And um, you know, ages are very difficult, as we were talking about. Ages are extremely difficult to determine sometimes. So. Um, so what we did was to have a uniform age, as uniform age sample as possible. So we um, um, used a, a zero chronology for the ages, and then uh, you know uh, the Dune survey had its dedicated observations to look at, at chromospheric emission for the ages, and then 
in the worst case, we'll use x-rays, or, or always in this order of, of decreasing reliability, right? So, you, so we used to, we tried to have a uniform sample of ages. And then we excluded all stars that were younger than 100 million years to, you know, get rid of biases introduced by disk evolution. And, um, and in a later step, we went even farther and we excluded uh, stars that were even older than, that, that were younger than a giga year, but I will talk about it later. So, uh, and I also excluded the stars with companions. And um, so stars that had companions with uh, within 100 AU were excluded. Why? Because uh, there might be a different disk frequency between singles and multiple uh, planets uh, and multiple star systems. Um, uh, for example, the multiplicity frequency uh, of debris is hot uh, is within the debris sample is found to be 28%, uh, which is a sl uh, smaller than the 50% that you will expect for field stars. So, um, so stars in multiple systems seems to have a lower inc incidence rate of, of disks, which you know makes sense because you know they interact, right? But um, this will bias if we are looking for for correlation. If there is uh, you know uh, companions with bias, bias the result, and then I also excluded um, and and then the other thing is that there might be a different planet frequency uh, uh, comparing single stars and stars in multiple systems. These are as uh, some observations. This is from the VLT observations. This is looking at uh, around 130 objects, uh, and they find that the difference in multiplicity frequency for for uh, systems that are at, uh, with a binary distance of less than 100 EU um, between uh, non-planet and planet host is about 13%. So there has different multiplicity frequency. And also there was another study done recently about uh, that it was looking at the multiplicity of Kepler multi-planet hosts. They were looking at 130 stars. And they see that the multiplicity frequency of stars observed by Kepler that have multiple planets is significantly lower than field stars. Anyway, the point is that if we have companions, we might introduce bias in the correlation. So I got rid of companions within 100 AU. And so we have this clean sample that has 204 solar type stars within 20 AU, younger than, old, sorry, older than 100 million years, and they have no companions within 100 AU. And then of those, 29 uh, have disks, 22 have planets, we have 16 with high mass planets, plus another unconfirmed one, so 17, and then six with low mass planets, plus two unconfirmed, unconfirmed ones, so eight. And then of those, 12 are single planet systems and 10 are multiple planet systems. And then you know, I, I was also interested in metallicity, so some of them, so of, the, of this, all we have metallicity information about 136, and then of those, you know, uh, the average of our distribution in metallicity is uh, minus point of 12, so, you know, uh, some of them are below that number and some of them are over that number. So, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And I, I believe uh, this is coming from mostly from the DIOS sample, so it's, it's from dedicated observations mainly. So, I mean, some of them might be not, but in general it's quite uniform sample as the ages. So, this is how the, the, um, the final sample, the, and of course all this, all this cleanup was not done by the preliminary study, right? Um, and this is how the samples, this is like the distribution of our stars in, um, in distance. This is the distribution of in age, just to give you an idea like the, where the sample is. And the different colors here indicate like blue is for stars with disks that harbor disks, red is for stars that harbor high mass planets, green is for stars that harbor low mass planets. And um, so, and then I look at these frequencies within these different sets. Um, so what was the f this frequency in our, you know, all the sample, and then I have a sample of stars with no known planets, and then a sample of high, a high mass planet sample, a low mass planet sample, and a debris sample, right? And then a single uh, planet sample and a multiple planet sample, and then I compare these frequencies among all of these. This is, yeah, this is radial velocity observation, mainly. Yeah, like uh, almost all of them. Yes. Right, right, and I'm going to yes, yeah. So and that's one of the limitations, right? 
And then I also look at the different these frequencies between um, for stars older than a giga year and stars younger than a giga year. And then I look at the different these frequencies also for different spectral types to see if the spectral type may play a role because I have FGAs and Ks. Oh yes, you can find uh, yes. When when you when it's especially resolved, you can tell the orientation. But many of these disks are not especially resolved, so you know then you cannot tell. But in here it doesn't really matter because um, you are seeing is thermal emission. You are seeing everything that is there. So it's not like a scattered light. It doesn't really matter because it doesn't matter if you're face on or edge on. In thermal emission, you see everything. Yeah, 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 the orientation is random, yes, yes, yes. What do you mean by excess frequency? Excess frequency, that's uh, the, so it's excess with respect to the stellar photosphere. So this is like the debridish frequency. Okay, so it's not frequency above the stellar photosphere? No, it's frequency over what you expect from there, each stellar photosphere. Okay, so it's basically It is the frequency of debridish, yeah. I don't know why I put the excess, yeah. It's the frequency of debridish. Um, and then I look also about, the, uh, you know, at what the frequency was for stars of different metallicities to see if I could recover some of the non-correlations as a sanity check, right? So um, how about the, um, because I know the ages, I can look at, at, you know, what's the effect of a stellar age in this frequency and flux ratio. So I have two plots here. So this is for, this is the cumulative frequency of the uh, excess ratio. This is the ratio of the, oh, I, I'm missing one thing here. So this is the excess, so this is the flux at 100 microns from the dust divided by the flux at 100 microns from the star. So there is a, a star missing here, right? So this is the, this is the, X, the flux ratio. So dust divided by, by photospheric emission. Uh, and this is the, cumula the cumulative frequency, so the distribution. And the upper line, and there are two, there are two colors here. So um, uh, black is for stars older than one giga year and red is for stars uh, younger than one giga year. And the, you know, the top line is the optimistic case where you assume that all upper limits are at the, you know, are, you, you adopt the upper limit, the three sigma upper limit for all the stars with non-detections and then a pessimistic case where you assume that the flux for those non-detections is zero. And then we look, you know, uh, whether or not they are different. And we basically have, no evidence that the two distributions are different. I mean, I'm just showing you the plot, but I can show you the numbers now. So we don't see evidence of evolution on giga year time scale. And this is actually, f uh, again, plotting the uh, flux ratio from the dust divided by the star as a function of age. The different colors indicate like the black here is for, for, detec uh, for detections, detections of a star or the disk. So the real detections, this is for non-detections where we don't get neither the disk or the photosphere. And then um, blue is when you would have an excess detection, so you have a debridis detection, and then whether you have high mass planets, low mass planets, or low mass planets, or unconfirmed planets. Anyway, you see that there are no trends here. I don't see any trends. Uh, I mean, you can see it visually, and you can see it from the numbers, so we don't find evidence of evolution on giga year uh, time scale. Well, you see they are, they are a bunch. No, I think I think they are. No, no, no. I think I, it depends. What it depends on the wavelength. If you are look, looking at, you know, 24 micron, yes, it declines quite rapidly. And for older systems, you have very few systems with 24 micron emission. But at 70 micron, 100 micron, like this, um, in longer wavelengths, you can have that. There is no evolution. Basically, the evolution is fairly flat. So. Well, they replenish, and uh, you know the plant. The, but the, the it's obvious that the the parent bodies are going to grind down eventually, right? But it seems that there is no evidence that they disappear altogether. What destroys the the grains? The well, yeah, the grains. It depends on the regime in which you are. If you are in a regime like at the solar system, uh, where there are not that many grains around. Then you are dominated by, the dynamics is dominated by pointing Robertson track. So what destroys the grains are, you know, that the particle spirals toward the central star. 
until it sublimates. And if you are in a regime where there are a lot of collisions, it is the collisions that destroy the grains until you because you make them smaller and smaller until they are blown away by radiation pressure. I should know, like, <laughs> I spent two months <laughs> this year <laughs> because, um, so the, the people that did the, the reduction of the data said, you know, we need help, right? And they gave me the catalog of the fluxes so I can do the analysis. Um, but someone needed to go and visually inspect all the images. So for two months, I was just looking at these images. And I found a lot of confusion. I found a lot of objects where I could you know, I'm like, okay, the, the, uh, yeah, like, I was very pessimistic. But then we went one by one, and they convinced me that it was fine, that, you know, the, the, the way that they take the, phot the, the aperture, the aperture photometry, or, well, it's not really aperture photometry, it's CSF photometry, that things were fine. So I don't know, so, like, I cannot give you a quantitative answer. I, I think that things have improved a lot. But to the untrained eye, like my eye, um, I would say that there is a lot of crap. <laughs> but but there are like there are papers that are looking from the cosmological point of view, like you know how many background galaxies there are, and um, we expect to have a few within the sample, but not many. It's like in 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 um, for debris, uh, which is like 446 objects. I think we expect to have less than 10 uh, galaxies that are contaminating. The, the so that will be very close, so close to the object that will be contaminating the mission. I think it's of that order, but I mean, I can I can look for the for the reference. I mean, it's uh, the the um, the reference is uh, um, Bruce. Um, I can never pronounce his name. Sif board, <laughs> but I look for it. Yeah, yeah. So it's of that order. It's of that order. So I don't think we are contaminated. But with a Spitzer was different because a Spitzer the, the spatial resolution was lower, right? So there was much, there were more. And as I said, some of the these frequencies have dropped down because some of the uh, some of the, the the discs were they were galaxies, really. But so there is a new class of objects that have appeared with Herschel, and these are the very cold discs. These are discs that have only emission at 160 microns and beyond and have no emission at 70 and 100 microns. So the Dunes team have, ha, has claimed that, you know, this is a new type of debris disks, but then um, people have, have gone back to this and have, you know, th they think that many of these objects are, are background galaxies. So. You know, there was one that we have a sad story about this. There was one that we proposed under the dunes team, uh, I mean the debris team, and um, we had to back up uh, because we realized that the, the it wasn't as cold as we thought, and uh, we couldn't find a replacement with the sensitivity uh, high enough in order to be detected, so we lost the time. But we had to be honest, right? I mean, we just couldn't find a replacement, and that's it, right? So they are not, I don't think there are that many, uh, at least with the configuration. I, I don't know with, you know, now we have added more antennas, right? They have added more antennas. So I don't know what's the status now, but for example, for the, but even for the, like HL Tau, that the spectacular image of Alma, um, that's one of the brightest. Um, so probably there is uh, more images. So I'm talking about, um, so this is one of the brightest disks that, uh, is out there, and uh, probably we can uh, observe things um, like we can have a bit. So this is about 20% brighter than, you know. So we probably have a l population of objects that can, for which we can have, the, uh, that are bright enough for which we can have this resolution, but not that many. I mean, th there should be, but this is protoplanetary, right? So for, for the disks. I mean, we were very excited at the beginning that ALMA will be a spectacular, but now the sensitivity, we are realizing that the sensitivity might not be uh, good enough in order to, you know, have that type of detections for the but. Is it the, 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 
Well, probably they are very faint and we don't see them. And, and yes, yes, yes. Okay, where, we, where are we? So, so we were looking at the, that there is no evidence of, so and these are the numbers. So this is the visual, you know, of that there is, we don't find evidence of evolution on the giga year time scale. And this is the, the number. So what we do is we use survival analysis tests to look at the, um, how, you know, the distribution of the flux ratio um, uh, can be drawn from the same population in, in the samples that we are comparing. And then we look at, you know, KS test, Fisher exact test, and then we compare the, the these frequencies uh, using a bimodal, uh, assuming the bimodal, uh, bimodal distribution. Yes? Uh, so Bin the flux yeah. This, sorry. The mass, um, mass is difficult, right? Because it depends. Oh, that's just in those grains. So um, we are talking about it's optically thin, right? So uh, as I said, we we can get up to um, about ten times the amount of dust. So the faintest disks that we observe is about 10 times the amount of dust in the solar system. So that's the amount of dust in the solar system is like three times 10 to the minus 10 solar masses, something like that. I have it in solar masses in my head. So, <laughs> so, um, so it's about 10 times the amount of dust in the Kuiper belt, which is another interesting question, like how much dust is in the Kuiper belt? And I don't think we currently know. Yeah, like. It's why it's really easy to have just the dust from the wind and the wind from the sand and then add it all and then you can do this. But it's going to be something in years from now when we have all this space and we can have this in the dust and then. You, uh, you mean to a. So much dense matter is driving down. Oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. Like to say, like if you will have a population of planetesimal cells that will allow yeah. to, to do that. Yeah, no, I think that's fine. I don't think that's a problem. That's a problem more like for systems with um, 20. So systems like, for example, HD 69, HD 0, where you have, uh, which is an interesting system because it has like three planets and it has a lot of uh, uh, dust at 24 microns and it has no dust at 70 microns. And that much dust at 24 microns uh, it's not sustainable. So uh, it has to be like a stochastic process producing it because it, because you, as you said, you will grind down the planetesimals because it's produced at 24 microns, you, you know, it's closer in, you have a lot of, you know, the dynamical activity, the dynamical time scale there is faster. So you will erode down the planetesimals if you sustain that amount of dust production for the edge of the system. But for these systems, where the, 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 you know, the, the dust is farther out, Planetesimals producing the dust are harder out. I don't think that's a worry. I think that's a worry more for systems uh, with warm dust. Because you think it's too high? Point one Jupiter. That sounds very high. Yeah. Yeah. The what? Uh, around these stars, there is evidence of what we have for this. Uh, so when you have asteroids, you will produce dust at, you know, closer to the star, warming to the star. So what we have here is evidence of a lot of um, Kuiper belt objects. So Kuiper belt more than asteroids. Okay. Of the, of the, um, of the bodies producing the dust. No, no, I mean, it's, 
yeah, from the Kuiper belt, there are estimates of the, you know, the size distribution, and from the asteroid, there are estimates as well of the size distribution. Yeah. Yeah, but that's the size distribution of the dust particles. He's talking about the dust oh, distribution okay. of the planetesimals, the obvious producing, right, right. That, that's like, yeah, I think that's difficult enough to do it in the solar system than, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> for, for this is not possible, right. Um, then we look at the, you know, the, the, using this sample to see if there was a correlation with the presence of high mass planets, right? And we found that, um, so this is, I miss, even though I saw that there was no evidence of evolution within the giga year time scale, I'm still excluding everything that was all, uh, younger than a giga year, just to make sure. So for stars just young, older than one giga year, this is the comparison of how the, the, the dust flux ratio um, com uh, compares for stars without planets, the black, to how much high mass planets uh, in red and low mass planets. And you see that they are fairly the same. So and if you look at the numbers, again, um, you see that uh, none of the frequencies that appear here, not, uh, sorry, not of the, the values that appear here coming from the survival analysis or this other statistical test are low enough in order to claim that the populations are not drawn from the same distribution. So we don't have evidence in this sample either that high mass planets are correlated with the three disks. And then uh, why could that be? will be drawn from the same population. So 0.99 in the distributing system? Or yeah, we've been drawn. You need a very small numbers in there. So the probability that they are drawn from the same population is very low, okay. so that they are separate populations, so there is some type of correlation. So so why wouldn't you expect to have a correlation between you know, uh, planets, high mass planets and debris as well? Because you may have so first, we talk about the, the formation the, the formation conditions that you know if planets are very if planetesimals are very easy to form maybe, and planets are not. I mean, why would you have a correlation? But then you know it, it might also be due to the very diverse dynamical history, right? Uh, we know that there are instabilities in multiple planet systems that you know clear out planetesimal belts. We know that there is you know when the systems are in, in embedded in the in the cluster. Uh, you can have, you know, flybells, stellar flybells, and that can clear out the planetesimal belts for some of these systems. And uh, so, you know, the dynamical histories could be, you know, diverse enough that you wouldn't ke keep any correlations if it was there at the beginning, right? But we don't, uh, maybe it wasn't even there at the beginning, right? And then it might also be uh, something that Jeremy was pointing out before, is that we are tracing uh, also um, the dust and the planets and the planets that we are looking at and trying to search correlations for they are they are at different locations because we are you know the planets are coming from radial velocity observations and those are located closer in and then the planetesimals are located farther out so we are not looking at the same spatial scale so maybe that's why we don't have evidence of, of any correlation and um, and actually this is one of the things that we try to you know do with SIPs was actually search for the planets that were at the same special locations as the dust. So we selected from the samples a, a list of, of disks that had evidence of large inner clearance and then we went and tried to search for, for planets in those, in those uh, systems. And we, we could not find them. We can put upper limits, right? But we could not find them. So, but that was the motivation behind this is, uh, you know, we are doing these studies to search for correlations for disks and planets close in, but we had absolutely no information about the planets lying at the same special locations as the disks. So this is where the targets that we were, uh, um, uh, that were used for the debris uh, part of the SIP sample. So how about low mass planets? I saw, as I saw you from the plot here, you know, there doesn't seem to be evidence that these two plots are different, that these two lines are different. So, and when you look at the numbers, uh, none of these numbers are low enough to claim a correlation. You see that when you include uh, the unconfirmed planetary systems, these numbers start to be lower, but um, first, these systems are unconfirmed, and, uh, and second, um, these, these statistical tests do not take into account the uncertainty in the incidence rate of the, the control sample. 
So um, I wouldn't put too much weight on these numbers. I would put a bit, I, it's a combination of everything, right? But I, I don't think we see a correlation there either. Because again, we don't take the, we don't, so there is, I think I have it here. Yeah, so so neither of these two comments uh, take into account the uncertainty in the expected rate of the, of the reference sample. So those numbers are not low enough in order to detect a correlation. So it, once more, you know, the tentative result that was published, you know, when you go and look in detail at the data, uh, that correlation is not there. So, and what factors to could be contributing to the lack of correlation in the case of ma low mass planets? Well, um, that's the wrong plot, it should be this one. Um, so, so first, why would you expect to have a correlation? You will expect to have a correlation maybe because, you know, if planets, for a, a correlation between disks and low mass planets. If planets form um, out and migrated inward, the low mass planets, you will expect that as they migrate, will be more inefficient at accreting or ejecting planetesimals. And this will uh, leave you with a higher disk frequency. Uh, so high mass planets will be more efficient, leading you to a lower disk frequency. So um, you will expect to have, uh, you know, to have disks more frequent uh, around low mass planet stars and high mass planets. And if the, if the planets form in situ as well, um, because the time scale to eject planetesimal will be low for low mass planets and high for, uh, sorry, long for, for low mass planets, so you will expect to have more, more disks and short for high mass planets. So, you know, in some areas, uh, so under these two scenarios, you will expect to have a correlation, but we don't find it. So why is not there? Well, uh, we think that it may be because, again, we have diverse dynamical histories, so the, you know, migration scenarios may be more complicated than what I just described, or maybe just because of the sample size, because I've cleaned the sample so much uh, to make sure that I don't have biases in there, that um, the, like, for example, our Fisher exact test will only detect the disk frequency, um, uh, a correlation in the disk frequency if the disk frequency is four times higher in the low mass planet sample compared to the control sample. So, you know, the statistics are limited, um, but it's limited because y you need a clean sample and you want to get rid of other biases, right? So, um, so, the, so we, the our caveats are, are, you know, the disk detections that uh, currently we are only sensitive, we are not sensitive to solar system analog. Um, we can only detect uh, dust at the solar system, like 10 times the dust at the solar system level, like for uh, stars that are close by. So we need to go deeper. Um, for example, SPICA, uh, which is a mission that was being considered uh, for ESA, ESA and, and JAXA, uh, will allow that because it will be like a Herschel, but cool at 6K. Uh, so it will have much better sensitivity. Unfortunately, unfortunately a SPICA launch is getting farther and farther and farther, and farther away. What? Yeah, like I just heard that ESA has reconsidered the configuration of SPICA, so now it's going to be like instead of having the telescope parallel to the spacecraft, it's going to be like off axis, like Planck, and this is quite complicated for the uh, cryogenic part, so you don't, it, it's not clear, like they have to reconfigure the whole design, and it's not clear if this is going to move forward, and also the um, the launch vehicle is getting smaller and smaller, so Spica seems to be shrinking as well. So um, I don't know what's going to happen, but if it happens, uh, it will be great for, for the study of the British because it's going to be much more sensitive uh, than, than Herschel because it's cooled down and um, it will have better sensitivity, lower noise. Um, but one of the th one of the big caveats of this of this study of this statistical study is that. Um, is coming from the planet for from the radial velocity observations. First, we are limited to low mass planets that are you know fairly close to the star. <coughs> we need this. Uh, we need to wait for these uh, um, radial velocity studies to you know accumulate s um, years. No, so we can have a better constraint of lower mass planets farther out from the star. But also the problem is that these guys don't publish the non detections, so our control sample may be contaminated by uh, stars that actually harbor planets, right? Um, we need a non-detection, so we can have a control sample that is really clean, that uh, stars for which we actually know that there are no planets out to a given distance, and they don't publish the non-detections. Um, another thing that we look at was the effect of planet multiplicity on the disk frequency, mm -hmm. and um, 
we were interested into this because um, if out of these simulations where you have multiple planet system systems embedded in planetesimal belts, uh, you see that there might be, we, we get that there might be a correlation between the presence of multiple planets and, and debris because when you have multiple planets, imply that you have a calmer dynamical environment that may have been um, more amicable for uh, planetesimals to live there for longer periods of time. Um, so it was interesting to see if there was any correlation between the, the debris disks and the presence of multiple planet systems. So we look into that and uh, these are the statistical tests and you see that um, this compares debris disk frequencies and the distribution of dust, uh, the dust flux ratio for si multiple planet system compared to single planet systems. We find no evidence that debris disks are more or less common around stars harboring multiple planet systems to compared to single planet systems. So again, you know, the theory predicts something, the simulations predict something, but it's not in the data. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I keep like trashing all this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, now I'm, yeah, this is going right now. Um, well, the dust temperature, we don't see any correlation on dust temperature either, so we don't, but the lo low number, it's very low number of statistics here, but we don't find that the dust with this very low number of stars that we have, uh, we don't find that the, the characteristic temperature of the dust is any different in the stars with planets and the stars with no planets, and let's go to metallicities. So this is the distribution of metallicities for a uh, high mass planet sample in, in red, and this is for the low mass planet sample the debris sample and the control sample, uh, stars for which no planets are known. And, um, and this is the comparison of the cumulative frequency for the stars in our high mass, high metallicity sample and low metallicity sample, um, where the, you know, the, the breaking is like the average of our, of the, the, the average of our distribution of metallicities. And in this case, we do see evidence of a correlation. We see that there is a correlation between high metallicities and, and the presence of planets and low metallicity. And, and uh, so we have, let me go back. So there is a correlation. So first, let's, let's look at the, at the debris disk. So um, comparing the stars with debris disk to the control sample, we see uh, and comparing the metallicities, we see that there is no evidence of correlation between the presence of debris and the presence of high stellar metallicities. So go back to the previous slide. Yep. Doesn't the bottom one look like uh, there's more high metallicity around? Is, is this so, okay. So th this is just looking at the debris, right? Because this is excess emission. So here, would you think um, is that there is uh, that it stars with um, Low metallicities lack, um, so you have that it stars with low metallicities, uh, which is the red sample, uh, uh, lack um, bright debris disk, right? Uh, however, when you look at the numbers, it's not statistically significant. So this difference is not statistically significant. So there is no evidence that the stars with high metallicities have more debris or that the debris is brighter. We don't find evidence. We don't find evidence of that. And this is coming. And you, this is. Oops. The numbers. So the numbers will be here. You see, none of these numbers are low enough to claim that there is a correlation. So visually, you may think that is in there, but I'm. I, you don't see the error bars here, right? So, but it's not significant. But what is significant is this difference. The difference between the distribution for the cumulative uh, fraction of. Uh, for for metallicities for high mass planets compared to low mass planets control sample and debris disks. So that is significant when you go to those. So how the stellar metallicity, so the, so this, this number, see how small they are? So in here, we recover the correlation between uh, high metallicities and high mass planets. So it starts with high metallicities uh, tend to have uh, have a higher incidence uh, rate of, of, uh, of high mass planets. So we recover that correlation, which is good. I mean, we, we recover something, right? So it's a sanity check. And then when you look at the low mass planets, we don't see evidence of a correlation either. So um, these numbers, okay. So these numbers here are not low enough to claim that there is a correlation between high metallicities and low mass planets. So um, high mass planets are correlated with high stellar metallicities, but debris disks and planets are not. 
So that's the, and the final thing that I wanted to show you is how does the distribution, how, how do these disks compare to our own solar system? So this is the distribution. This is the distribution of the, the, the cumulative distribution of fractional luminosity. So here, uh, the fractional luminosity is already uh, taking into account the observations at other wavelengths. So this is like all the luminosity, the luminosity in, in the dust, right? At all wavelengths divided by the luminosity in the star. And this is the distribution of fractional luminosities. Uh, and the different lines here, the different colors are the ones that you will expect from a Gaussian distribution in logarithmic scale uh, centered at um, the solar system value. That will be the, the pink line at 0.1 times the solar system value, uh, three times the solar system value, uh, and 10 times the solar system value. So um, the, and from these plots, what we can say that we can reject a distribution of lum luminosity centered at 10 times the solar system value. Um, and this is interesting. So do you see what I'm saying? So the distribution of, if you assume a Gaussian distribution, um, uh, our data is consistent with a Gaussian distribution of, 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 of la the, uh, um, fractional luminosity centered between one and uh, three times the solar system value. Yes. Well, um, a Gaussian distribution, so remember, if there is this disk evolution, you wouldn't expect a Gaussian distribution because you have, um, you know, a range of ages, right? But we are getting rid of the disk evolution, and this is only for a star. So this plot is only for a stars older than a million, a, a giga year, where there is no disk evolution. Yes, for at, but so the fluctuations for were more at 24 micron for the disk, for the, for the amount of dust. Yeah. A power law distribution, but that's if you amount for the, if you consider the disk evolution, I think. But if you get rid of the disk evolution uh, and you look only at the, at the, you know, all samples, maybe a Gaussian, well, Well, yes. I mean, you can see here, this is what we are having. So these are the observations. The black line is the observations. And the magenta, magenta line, the pink line, uh, is what you will expect from a Gaussian distribution center at one time the solar system value. Uh, from here is uh, sensitivity limited. So just we leave it from here on. So it is consistent with a Gaussian distribution. So that's, it is consistent. I mean, whether that's physically what you would expect. I mean, I, I think, I think because we are only focusing on a star older than one giga year, um, it's probably a fair approximation. The point is, the, the last point that I wanted to make is that this is interesting in the context of the search for planet detection and characterization because warm dust is a contaminant and it can, uh, you know, it, a con it just doesn't allow you to detect the, the disk and, you know, try to characterize by, uh, I mean, the planet and try to characterize by a signature. And um, so the amount of warm dust in these systems is one of the parameters that define the aperture size that you will detect, that you will need for a telescope, like, you know, at last to actually be able to characterize uh, uh, and, and detect biosignatures around terrestrial planets. So um, in having a knowledge of how much dust is in these systems is interesting from this point of view. Of course, there are dedicated surveys, and I referred to this at the beginning of the talk, that are actually looking at the warm dust, and there is like a program for in uh, the Large Binocular Telescope, the LBTI, that is actually looking uh, at that, and there are some results from, from uh, other, other um, facilities. Um, but th the information that we can get from the cold dust is also interesting because, um, so the, the observed distribution of fractional luminosity uh, that impli implies that we have a large number of debris disks uh, with, um, that have obviously evidence of planetesimals, so have dust levels at the Kuiper Belt system that uh, will be low enough not to become a significant source of, of, contaminant, of contamination for the detection of, planet, of, you know, pl of, of terrestrial planets. Of course, comets and asteroids can also produce dust in the inner system, but if you have 
low levels of dust in the outer system. Uh, that means that you have um, uh, um, that the Kuiper belt, the Kuiper belts are, are not very populated and they wouldn't be produ producing a lot of cometary activity. So it's interesting that there's a lot of systems out there that have, you know, evidence of planetesimals that um, they have dust, but not as much as to be a, con a contaminant. However, there is another aspect that there is al always the other flip of the, the, the other side of the coin, right? There is another aspect, and is that um, the dynamical simulations that I showed you before, where you have the three planets and all these planetesimal spells that, you know, I've been excited by the planet, they show that cold disks are highly correlated with the presence of terrestrial planets. So this is amount of dust at 70 microns, excess dust at 70 microns, and this is the total mass of terrestrial planets. You see that there is a correlation here. So systems for which you have a lot of cold dust are more amicable to the presence of terrestrial planets because if you have a lot of cold dust, that implies that the dynamical evolution has been mild enough to m allow the terrestrial planets to survive. The, the, this is dynamical simulation. So this is all dynamical simulations. It's coming from the model. So this is not an observation. This is what you expect from dynamical simulations of multiple planet system embedded in planetesimal belts with an inner belt and an outer belt. So you expect that systems with um, <coughs> systems that have retained a lot of you know material in the outer system. This is theoretical. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is theoretical. It's from the from this simulation that I show you here, right? The um, these guys from these simulations. So systems with um, so systems with a lot of dust uh, imply that the dynamical evolution have been mild enough to, you know, allow the planet the terrestrial planets to survive. So the problem is that systems with and, and in this case the solar system will be an outlier because it doesn't have a lot of mass in the outer belt, but it has a lot of terrestrial planets, right? Anyway, so um, but this implies that systems with you know um, little dust in the outer uh, system, um, uh, systems with, you know, little dust in the outer system that will imply that there is not that much of a contaminant uh, are also not amicable, may not be ami amicable for terrestrial planets. So, you know, I think extending this type of simulations would be very good in the context of, you know, trying to find good targets for, for an Atlas type mission. Um, and I, I see Tim like going like, hey, you have to finish, so I, I will just leave it here. So, do you have any questions? <laughs>